Welcome to the Modern Husbands Podcast, where any combination of Dr. Bruce Ross, Christian Sherrill, and Brian Page host national experts who share winning ideas to manage money in the home as a team. Today's guest is Abby Davison. Abby has dedicated her career to helping others achieve their goals, first as a social innovation leader, and now as an author, speaker, and entrepreneur. Abby is the co-author of Money and Love, an intelligent roadmap for life's biggest decisions and co-founded the Money and Love Institute. Abby holds a BA from Yale University and an MBA and MA in education from Stanford University. Today's episode will cover how couples can integrate money and love in decision-making, steps couples can take to establish a strong financial foundation in marriage, and much more. Enjoy the show. Abby, Dr. Ross and I are thrilled to, to have you here. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks so much, Brian. I loved your book, Money and Love, an Intelligent Roadmap for Life's Biggest Decisions. That's why I reached out. Uh, first, let's start with what it was that inspired you to co-author Money and Love, um, and how can it help couples manage their finances? Well, the inspiration for the book was actually a class that my co-author pioneered and taught for over four decades uh, at Stanford, where I met her. And I also met uh, a man who I had started to date. We met uh, and in business school, where my co-author taught and um, actually took her class together. It was called Work and Family. And we were making big life decisions ourselves. We were getting ready to graduate and needing to decide if we were going to accept jobs in the same city, if we ended up in the same city, would we live together? And Myra Strober, my co-author, because she's a labor economist and there was lots of data in her course, she had shared a statistic that couples who live together before getting married have higher divorce rates. And mm -hmm. that was surprising, counterintuitive yeah. a bit to us. And so we were curious. We didn't want that to happen to us. So what we did is for our final paper, dug into all the research out there, trying to uncover why was that the case? Is there anything that could be done to prevent it? And we ended up writing a blueprint for what turned out to be, this is the spoiler, uh, now 15 years of marriage. We'll celebrate in September. And um, the course really... Thank you. Uh, it really changed our lives. And, you know, we, the farther out we got from it, um, we actually were invited back as guest speakers for over a decade. So we stayed in touch with our professor. And one day when she retired in 2018, she told me she was planning to write a book about the course. And I said, that is a great idea. It's totally changed our lives and helped us have all the conversations that you need to have as a couple trying to navigate careers and family and all the obligations and many more people should benefit from this. And she said, that's great. Thank you for the endorsement. And meanwhile, I was climbing the corporate career ladder over at Gap Inc. I was leading their corporate foundation and I had started the employee resource groups for families over there. And so I had lunch about six months later and I said, how's the book coming? And she said, you know, I haven't written a word. And I said to her, uh, well, maybe you need an accountability partner, you know, starting the resource group for parents at Gap Inc. I did it with a working dad who was a lawyer and we, we worked on it together. And it was so helpful to have someone to bounce ideas off of and have accountability with. And she said, that's a great idea, but I need more than that. I need a co-author and you would be the perfect person having been putting all of these theories and lessons into practice for over a decade to write this book with me. And right then and there, I said yes on the spot. And I violated one of the first principles of our book, which is to never make big life decisions in an instant. <laughs> <laughs> but we had known each other for a very long time. And even though it was a, an instant decision, it was informed by uh, a long friendship and mentorship. And I knew that this was um, the right thing to do. And it has turned out to be a great decision. Awesome. What, what a great opportunity and, and what a great book. I mean, and as a professor, I can honestly say I love when students, one, check back in with me after they've graduated and tell me how great they're doing. Um, but also, like, if you get to continue to work with them in some way um, and that you have an assignment that really just, like, sets, like, a successful path in their life, that's, like, that's awesome to hear. So great for her. <laughs> great for you. <laughs> right? Um, Getting into the book a little bit, um, 
Can you explain this concept of integrating money and love in decision making? So how is it outlined in your book? Yeah, well, first of all, I'll say what the conventional wisdom is, because that was certainly the perspective I had before I joined the class and why the class was such a light bulb moment for me. So so I was always taught, I don't know about you, both of you, but that you should make career decisions and financial decisions with your head. You should analyze them. You should, you know, be strategic about them um, because, yeah. you know, you want to have the, the best outcome, the best result. Um, and that's very analytical. And then I was taught, and the conventional wisdom says, that for relationship decisions, you should just follow your heart. You should you know, let your emotions be your guide and don't bring money into it because that's materialistic. Um, and the truth is that that is a terrible way to make decisions because all uh, decisions about finances, about careers have relationship implications and decisions about love, about um, who you are going to spend your life with, for example, have career implications and have financial implications. And so by thinking about these elements holistically, you're better able to make a more informed, more um, better decision that will uh, take all of the elements into account. And so what the book advocates and what I learned in the class and have since put in practice in my life is to think about money and love together, not in silos. Think about every decision from both of those perspectives and what we offer in the book is a framework for how to do that, how to slow down your decision making. So you're not making decisions out of emotion or in an instant, uh, but you're turning over the right rocks that will help you integrate the holistic elements of money and love into your choices. Awesome. I love that. It's a, it's a both and um, kind of thing. Absolutely. And that's actually, honestly, that's how I was raised to kind of think through things. And um, that's how I try to communicate that with my students. And hopefully they get that. But um, I remember my grandfather actually always had a line when trying to decide even your careers and your jobs, where you're going to take, if you got two different offers, it really unless it was a significantly different salary, which it rarely is a significant difference, right? It's where are you going to have the most fun? Mm -hmm. Where are you going to be the happiest? Um, right? Because it's, you got to manage all of that, right? It's not just about the money. It's not just about the promotional track, I guess. It's what's it going to do for your life? Absolutely. Right? Your grandfather uh, was very wise. Yes, he was ahead of his time, I think. Um, as you said, it was against the conventional wisdom, right? Um, so what are some of the practical steps that uh, you discussed that couples can take um, to establish a strong financial uh, foundation in their marriage? Well, the first is to commit to having the conversations. So in our, in our framework, um, I'll just mention it briefly, it's called the five C's. Um, the first C is to clarify what's important to you. So there is some self-reflection involved. Um, but the second C is to communicate. And it's really about not shying away from those conversations that sometimes seem really daunting or make you have a pit in your stomach. Um, the conversations that my husband, you know, then boyfriend and I were having as part of this class were really not easy ones, especially, you know, early on in our relationship. You know, for example, he was going to work in the financial world. He was working for a hedge fund. And I knew that I was working for a nonprofit after graduation. So we did have wildly different salaries we were going to be making. And so, for example, one of the questions that came up is, should we be contributing the same amount towards rent? We did decide to live with each other, by the way, um, based on the research. We felt like we could overcome the negative outcomes. Um, and it it was, you know, th this kind of nerve wracking to have that conversation because I didn't want to be um, seen as not contributing my fair share. And at the same time, I knew that, you know, it was my salary was going to be a, a fraction of his. So we pushed through the discomfort. My co-author likes to talk about um, you feel like you're at the edge of a very tall diving board and you, you <laughs> really don't want to jump off, but that diving board is not getting any lower. And so partly it's just, you know, committing to push through the discomfort. And the truth is, it's like a muscle. The more you use it, the more you push through the discomfort and have those conversations that are off 
awkward, that are going to feel um, a bit icky, if you will, the easier that next conversation becomes. And, you know, now that we've had this practice for, um, you know, 18 years, my husband and I have these types of conversations you know, I wouldn't say they're easy, but they're much more comfortable where we have a, a greater facility with the language and an ability to know when we you know what's the best setting for us. For example, we like to have these conversations on hikes because we can let our kids mm. run up ahead. We can have a you know feeling of expansiveness with when we're outside and we're not looking directly at each other, which gives us an ability to be more vulnerable in a way because um, it's kind of why your kids will talk to you in the car, right? When you're driving them everywhere, right. um, they're you're not looking deeply into their eyes, so they feel <laughs> less daunted by what they're going to disclose. I love that. I, I love having a nature hike talk. That's such a great idea. Uh, so you. Uh, going back there, you said there were five C's for the Strong Financial Foundation. So it was clarify, communicate. Uh, the third is choices, thinking choices. about a broad range of choices. Um, the fourth is check in with friends, family, and trusted resources. And the fourth is consider the likely consequences on different time horizons. And these five C's are for any big decision, by the way, not just financial ones, but um, decisions about um, whether and when to move, decisions about um, what might make sense for um, a elderly relative that might need your help. So th this framework is designed to be sturdy, meaning you can rely on it over and over again, but flexible in that you can apply it to a broad range of life decisions. I, and I'm I'm super interested about uh, the research that says it's best not to live together in advance of getting married. Uh, can you briefly share why that is? And you and you mentioned that you felt like that you could overcome whatever that reason was. What yeah. was it? Well, and I should say that the time we were doing this was in 2008, and so um, it was there. Were, it's much more normalized. And I actually just read an article about the cost of living being so high in cities that now people are moving in together after only a couple months of dating in order to save on rent. So I will say, you know, the data we were looking at yeah. is very different than if you wrote that same paper today. However, I believe that what we found will remain true, which is that if you look at the couples who went into that in arrangement intentionally, meaning they had conversations about how they were going to combine their lives, how they were going to combine finances, um, even who was going to do what chores, those couples did not have those negative outcomes. The problem turned out to be the couples that slid versus decided, right? So right. they, they that makes kind sense. of said, mm. we're already spending most nights together. Your lease is up. Why don't we just do this? It's, you know, the next step in our relationship. But they didn't talk about what does this mean to you? One person might think it's, you know, on the path towards marriage and the other might think, oh, this is great. I'm saving half of my rent, right? And and those are very different perspectives. But if you don't yeah. ever talk about it, that could lead to resentment and that could, and sometimes you slide into all of these decisions versus decide, right? You slide into the living together, then you slide into getting engaged because you're already living together, then you slide into marriage. And then somebody wakes up, you know, several years later and say, wait, this is totally not what I want. We're not on the same page about, you know, our future. And and then that is where the the divorce rates come in. And so if you have all those conversations ahead of time, go into the arrangement, knowing what it means to both of you and being on the same page about it, those negative outcomes go away. Uh, I I've been married for 22 years and I just get <clears throat> queasy thinking about moving in with a, a girlfriend to save on rent. I, I, <laughs> that just spells disaster to me. I think that's something you do with like a buddy. Uh, but what you're, what you're saying makes total sense. And I'm really glad you brought up not just the money angle, but also the chores, right? I mean, you, the last thing that you need is to squabble about the division of labor at home. And I know, I mean, that's, I know that's why we're, we're not, we're not going to talk about this in this episode, but that's a big part of what we do at Modern Husbands as well, to mm -hmm. make sure that we partner uh, with our spouses, not just to manage money as a team, but, but to manage, manage the home as a team. So, uh, I just want to go. And I love the that. I love that you're doing that. I think you know, as you know, there's a whole chapter in the book talking about um, combining chores and and eventually, if you do have kids, the childcare because those issues are so challenging and and not enough. You know, in heterosexual couples, not enough men are um, initiating that conversation. And so I I just applaud what you're doing. I think it's so needed. 
Oh, I, yeah. thank you. I that that means a lot to to us. We mm -hmm. we believe that you know once once men understand the importance of it, uh, you know, research says that actually men end up being happier at the end of the, all of those conversations yeah. uh, than women because uh, now the sudden you know we feel like that we're a provider in more ways than one. We're a provider in many ways, and we're not limited to being a breadwinner. We're we're also you know recognizing that you know our wives or or our husbands um, that. They are total human beings that have ambitions beyond just being a, a wife or just being a, 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 a mother. Uh, many have career aspirations too. And how is it as husbands, can we support that in their lives as well so they can experience self-actualization? Um, so, so anyhow, yeah, we, uh, and I appreciated that, that chapter in your book. Yeah, absolutely. Um... And, and I can see and just how you're talking, how you overcame that, you know, those statistics about moving in together before marriage. I can see the five C's kind of laid out and how you had those conversations and how you talked through everything. You really planned it out. Um, so that's just that's awesome and definitely a great recommendation for our listeners. As a Modern Husbands podcast listener, you recognize the importance of evidence based advice from leading national experts for your marriage. That's why we know you will love our marriage toolkit. Nearly 50 national experts came together to provide bite-sized advice to manage the toughest topics couples face in managing money in the home as a team. Go to modernhusbands.com for your free preview of our marriage toolkit to start, strengthen, or rebuild your marriage. Once again, that's modernhusbands.com to sign up for your free preview of our marriage toolkit. Now back to the show. Um, so for those that are early in their relationship, how do you suggest couples kind of approach this topic of money, especially if we want to ensure like transparency and trust? Yeah, it's such a great question. And I think there's lots of ways to approach it. I think the first thing is just to commit to talking about it, right? It's one of those topics that we tend to want to avoid. It's uncomfortable. It's such a taboo, yep. right? In our Ooh, society, yep. um, we will talk about our sex lives with our friends much more than we'll talk about, you know, our money and our bank account balances in some ways. So um, I think the, the first thing is, is to, again, um, contextualize it at a time that makes sense. So I'm not saying on the first date, you have to, you know, bring out your uh, <laughs> bank statements or bring up, you know, your mobile banking Credit app. Report. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, that's, that's a second date thing, right? Yeah. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like to say it's before you go on a trip together, right? That should, you know, oh. often early on in your relationship, you're like, oh, it'd be fun to take a road trip. It's summer, you know, let's go somewhere. Um, and that's a perfect time to say, you know, we haven't like really that. talked about money yet. We're going to be spending money on a place to stay. We're going to be, there's lots of different yeah. ways to get there, right? We could drive, we could fly, we could take a bus, right? And so it's a, it's a great time to just start to offer your own perspectives. And everyone has money stories, right? We all have uh, this, these baggage, if you want to call it, or, you know, stories from when we grew up and how we were raised that we bring, you know, subconsciously or sometimes very consciously into mm -hmm. relationships. And so just to even voice those and, you know, being the one to go first can be really helpful to say, you know, I'll share some of my money stories. You know, my parents um, would be very frugal, but they always spent money on travel, food and books. And it's so interesting because as an adult now, those are the things that I spend money on. Mm -hmm. I always thought it was so wild. I'm like, why do you, you know, spend money on food? Like, it's just this temporary thing. But now, you know, it's very important. And we are very influenced by how we were raised. So committing to, to sharing some of those stories with your um, partner and starting to make it a practice to talk about some of those preferences can be really helpful. We have exercises at the end of each chapter in our book that can help to guide some of those conversations. But you mentioned this word um, transparency, and I want to go back to that because I think it's really interesting, particularly for couples as over time, they, they've they built trust and they are um, starting to do things like combined bank accounts. There's a great book that I recommend to your listeners and to you called um, Tight Wads and Spendthrifts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By, We've yes, got Dr. Rick. Do, do you yeah, have it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's so a great you know, book. I mean, what he yeah. advocates for is not transparency, it's financial translucency. Right. And I mm -hmm. love that term because 
there is data that says, yes, you should have a joint bank account. Yes, you should be you know, aware of how you combine your money, but you don't need to combine everything. And in fact, it's almost better if you reserve a small portion of, you know, if you're contributing your salaries to this joint bank account, you have a small portion of money that's just for you that you don't have to talk mm. through with your partner because you don't want to start to resent them and you don't want to start to be like, oh, you're keeping tabs on my spending. I mean, nobody wants to be under the microscope, right? So if you've built that trust, um, if you've over time demonstrated that, you know, you're very responsible with the joint decisions, you should have the ability to, you know, use your own money however you want. And one of the icebreaker questions that I love in on a, you know, does it, it could be even a first date is what do you spend reckless amounts of money on? Because we all have those like guilty pleasures, right? Like my husband will always buy some technological, you know, gadget that I'm like, wait, what does that do? You know, he's like an early adopter and I don't, that's not my thing, but you know, I have other things that I like to spend my own reckless amounts of money on and just get that out there from the beginning. So we're not all, you know, pretending that we're hundred percent responsible about our financial decisions all the time. Cause we're human. I it, listeners, if, if that intrigues you and in how to manage bank accounts in your marriage, uh, have a look at our past episodes, ones with Dr. Scott Rick, it, it's tight wads and spend thrifts. And he, he discusses this in, in far more detail. And then we, we have multiple articles on that on our website, modernhusbands.com. And then uh, also have a listen to Dr. Olson on splitting finances. She was the one who conducted, she's an advisory board member of ours, and she conducted that groundbreaking research that found that for uh, first married couples and uh, engaged couples who combine all of their money that they end up over after two years happier, but that's not for everybody, um, but it is on the aggregate, the case. And then one more just to throw out there is Michael Van Cleve, who's getting his PhD on managing money in a blended family. And he shares the importance of actually having separate accounts, um, an account for your current family, and then an account for your, your uh, you know, kind of your, your kids from before. Uh, your previous life, life, because typically in your second family, uh, what happens is life is complicated, and that second account just simplifies it. Um, but I, I have to, I have to say, I'm going to give you Abby props because the idea of just simply saying in the back of your mind, "I'll bring money up just before our first trip," I love it because I feel mm -hmm. like that it, it, it is creating naturally an environment where those questions will just arise. Um, you know, how much do you plan on spending? How much would you like to spend um, on this vacation? And there's so many directions you can go with that. How important is travel to you? You know, what are there? Do you have like right now, are you trying to reduce your debt? Um, you know, totally. maybe, maybe we need to do this on the cheap, um, because you have, you know, student loan debt, like just natural ways where people don't feel like that they're being attacked because you're not attacking them. You're just trying to understand them, understand the circumstances. Uh, and I can think of 15 different questions right off the top of my head, just from that opportunity that's created to ask the questions just before you travel. So thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Oh, and, and I love it too. I, I totally agree, Brian, with all those questions you just asked, because you are essentially, you're planning, you have to kind of go through that planning. So it's natural, but then you've opened this door. So as you said, if you go on like a road trip, now you're in a car for, you know, six, nine hours, 10 yep. hours a day, you've opened this conversation. And so you can then start expanding to like, you know, what your parents did with their money or like how they talked about it or what's the, what are the future trips you're planning? Like all these other financial questions as well. Totally. You've normalized money yeah. as a topic of conversation and, and therefore it can be casual the next time you bring it up and that and your partner might be so relieved of like oh thank goodness that i can now talk about the fact that i am paying down student debt i mean right. i i can't wait for the netflix series where a couple meets and falls in love and discloses their educational debt to each other because oh. it's just not normalized in our society yeah. to bring these topics up and yet for so many of us it's a huge element of our of what we're spending every month. So yep. it's just it's something that I think we just need to normalize the topic and take whatever uh, opportunity we can to make it seem um, less forced. And I think the travel does that. Yeah, absolutely. I th there's a uh, there's a Simon in, a, in a, one of my classes that actually make them go talk to their partners if they have a partner about money, um, which is a 
stressful event in itself. But the number one I th thing I hear about afterwards is I've been waiting to have this conversation. Mm. Mm. And it's just because they don't from my students and from their partners, like because they just haven't had the conversation. And I, I love that a road trip or a just a trip in general. That's a great introduction. It's a real easy way to get into it. Um, if you don't have a, you know, demanding professor like me, that makes you go do it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I like to say blame the book, right? If you read the book and you say, oh, I just read this book called yeah. Money and Love. And I realized like we haven't had any of these conversations. Yeah. Let's sit down. Let's actually go on a financial date. I like this concept. <laughs> um, and and just, you know, get a bottle of wine, like pair it with a treat to have some something to look forward to. So it doesn't feel like this daunting thing. And um, and and yeah, you could get permission wherever you need, whether it's from your professor, from a book, um, from your podcast, Brian. Uh, but yeah, I think it's I think it's important to take those opportunities when they come. Love it. So getting back to kind of this, uh, the five C's of, you know, having this uh, strong financial foundation. Right. Uh, you talked about uh, communication as being one of the second C. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the role that communication plays in managing our finances together? Um, and I guess how we can improve any of those financial conversations. Yeah, well, I mean, communication is um, is so important, not just because of what you say, but about the conditions, right? The how you have the conversations, the when. The important, you know, one of the very important things is to have them regularly, right? So I think, again, we tend to put these things off as much as we can. But in our house, we live and die by our Google Calendar. Um, and so we <laughs> we definitely have um, these times where we just block off the calendar. We do and every week, um, just a, a we call it our taking care of business meeting, where we talk about the pickups <laughs> and the drop offs and you know the other things. But sometimes we'll talk about you know um, moving money in our bank accounts. We're both now entrepreneurs, and so you know we're we're funding some of our we're not you know raising venture capital, but we're funding some of our our business expenses through saving, which was very um, intentional. And so we talk about okay, well, how much do we need to you know move out? We just paid for a, a big family trip. Um, so that's on the calendar every week. But then, you know, also it's important to maybe once a quarter have a more, you know, dedicated conversation that is about, um, you know, if anything is changing, like if one person is trying to go for a promotion, if the other person is thinking of going part time, like those are the conversations that you don't really have in the moment, right? You need to have dedicated time um, and, and the space that makes sense. And so we talked about how I like to have bigger conversations on hikes. My co-author talks about being near a body of water for tricky conversations because that's very calming. And there's actually new research that um, that underlines that, that, that lakes and rivers and oceans are actually have very calming effects on us. And so, you know, finding the right, we, we so often think about what are the words that I'm going to say, but finding the right time and finding the right place to communicate is just as important. Love it. Love it. So on the flip side of that kind of thing, I guess, what are some of those common financial pitfalls that couples should avoid, um, you know, just in order to maintain a healthy financial relationship? Yeah, well, certainly um, putting off those conversations. I think, like I said, they're not easy <laughs> ones. And so for many of us, the temptation is just to say, Oh, I'll just, you know, talk about that next year. Um, we're, we're big uh, advocates, my co-author and I, of working with third-party experts. So whether that is a financial advisor, whether that is um, a financial therapist, if there is trauma, you know, in your past that many of us have, right, that we need to overcome, there are lots of resources that can help you um, look directly at some of these things because they're they're tricky and to have um, some partnership beyond the partner that you have in life to to work on those can be helpful. I mean another another pitfall is um, actually one of the um, the so so I would say the, the third party experts were getting at the check in step right because the check in mm -hmm. is helping you look at um, other resources, whether that's other couples that can be helpful to say, hey, how have you managed this over the course of your relationship? Um, 
Dr. Ross, you talked about your grandfather. You know, he might be someone um, back in the day that you looked up to um, and you thought about, you know, how he managed his money and his relationship. It's important to have these role models, right, who have a relationship that you admire and that you want to emulate and then ask them how they did it, not to follow it to the letter, but to just have an idea, right? We're also um, reinventing the wheel in the way that we do things. And so having other resources can be so helpful. Um, but it's also important to avoid this pitfall of thinking in black and white. And that's what the choices mm -hmm. step is really getting at is we see the extremes often, right? We see the, should I go for my, go for this promotion? And if I don't get it, I'm going to quit my job, right? Those are like two very different <laughs> paths. And there are lots of places in between that you might be able to play. And so just being creative and generating this broader set of choices um, can be helpful. And those third parties can help you generate those choices. So the, the choices and check-in step go hand in hand because sometimes we have such limited perspective based on where we're sitting. Uh, it's just the nature of it, right? We're in it. And so by getting out of our own way, by talking to people, by looking at published research, by listening to a podcast like yours, you can start to get more ideas that help you broaden that consideration set, which leads to better choices. Awesome. And, and, I, and I love the bit about if you listen to our podcast, you make, you're making better decisions. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so, um, no, this is this has been great. It's been a very fascinating conversation, and I know it's been helpful for our listeners. Um, I know that you're uh, teaching a course this fall. Uh, you mentioned. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. Well, I think that courses. You know, how I first encountered this material are really powerful. Um, I love people who will go out and buy a book and follow it to the letter, but so many of us need a bit more support, a bit more um, community in the way that um, a course, a cohort based course um, provides that. And so it's a course on um, making midlife career decisions with more ease and less angst. So for folks who have had some achievement, they're you know, middle or senior level in their careers, and they're trying to figure out their next career step. They're not ready to retire. Maybe that's not a financial option, or maybe that's not what they want to do, but they want some help uh, and support walking through this framework in the context of the type of impact that they want to have next in their careers, um, taking in all the other factors, right, that we know impact our careers, uh, our family obligations, our uh, passions outside of work, the purpose that we want to have in the world. And, uh, and so I'm really excited to offer this on Maven uh, in the fall. And for the, the podcast listeners, we'll be sure to include a link of where you can find um, Abby's course uh, within our podcast notes. Abby, what is one piece of simple and actionable advice for our listeners that you would like to conclude with today? So I'm going to go back to where we started, which is talking about the um, cohabitation effect, right? Living together without getting married. But I think that it's good advice for all big decisions, which is don't slide decide. Don't slide the side. Love it. Love it. Abby, great conversation. Thank you for joining us. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much to both of you. Thank you. A special thanks to our guest and of course, to all of our listeners. Don't forget to click subscribe wherever you download your podcast, give us a rating and share the Modern Husbands podcast with others. Doing so goes a long way in growing our reach. And join your fellow modern husbands and have links to our podcasts, articles, and other resources to manage money in the home as a team sent to your inbox every two weeks by subscribing to our newsletter at modernhusbands.com. Until next time, be well.